first is the renunciation of power in Tolkien's Lord of the Rings and Rowling's Harry Potter novels. It examines the way, the course does, the ways in which each author focuses on the uses and abuses of power, okay? and ultimately how each author suggests humility, strength, sacrifice, or the renunciation of power as the means to resist and defeat arrogance, ambition, and the quote-unquote will to power. That's a phrase from Nietzsche. Nietzsche was Hitler's favorite philosopher. Probably don't need to really say more than that. It's from Nietzsche, that, by the way, that we get the guy with the um, blue tights, you know, with the big red S on his chest, Superman. Not the superhero, but the idea of the Superman. The person who can overcome society's morals and little petty laws and stuff because this person is bigger and larger and better than society. So we'll talk about that. Okay? Uh, disclaimer, syllabus is subject to revision. What does that mean? It means we might get behind and, you know, there might be a quiz assigned on a day. It might get pushed back to another day, that kind of thing. It doesn't mean we're going to drop, you know, I don't know, Return of the King because we're behind. We're not going to drop any of the books. Okay? Um, if I'm going to cancel class, either I'm ill, the weather's bad, uh, whatever, I'll post it on D2L by 7 o'clock that morning. Okay? So if you've got a, you know, an hour-long drive uh, to get here, or an hour-and-a-half-long drive, you'll know well in advance. Okay? Students with disabilities, you know you have, you, you know who you are, and you know what you must do, and I won't say anything else. Cell phones, laptops, etc. Didn't used to include this, but it's gotten so bad the last couple of semesters, I now have to. Use of cell phones for calls, texting, selfies, yes, is strictly prohibited. I had a student, not last fall, a year ago, fall 2017. I'm not kidding. We were in one of the other classrooms where where you were um, facing like this way, and I'd be up there, and she would be back here. I'm not, I am not kidding. Every day, first 20 minutes, she's sitting there taking selfies. And I'm like, I can't remember now. What are you doing? I'm taking a selfie. Put it away. You know, she did poorly. <laughs> um, don't, okay? If, however, you are a first responder of some sort, fireman, EMT, police, etc. You've got a, either phone or pager. Let me know, and you can keep it out. Similarly, if you have now an ongoing family medical situation slash emergency, or one develops in the course of the semester, let me know immediately. Somebody in your immediate family, your best friend, gets in a car wreck, they're taken to the hospital. Obviously, deal with what you need to deal with immediately, immediately. But within 24 hours, shoot me an email. Let me know. And I will move heaven and earth to work with you to make sure you can finish the rest of the semester. I had a student last fall. Close family member, I think, she, I think it was her, her grandmother, she's pretty much raised by her grandmother, the mom was out of the picture for the most part, uh, died either just before the beginning of the semester or just after the beginning. And she was a wreck. She, you know, probably made it to class five times the entire semester. I didn't hold the attendance against her. She turned in every assignment. She didn't do well. She turned in every assignment. She barely passed the class, but she passed the class, okay? Um, I will work with you, but you have to notify me immediately. If something happens two weeks from now and you email me middle of March, too bad. I mean, I'll say, you know, I'll pray for your family member, but you waited too long, okay? Especially, you know, I had a student last fall waited until the last week of classes. Something happened the second week of class, she notified me the last week of class. You made your bed. <laughs> so, if that kind of thing happens, let me know immediately. And as I said, um, I will work with you. Okay? The bottom of this mentioned 
strongly discourage the use of laptops, uh, tablets for note taking. I mentioned a number of studies in, in, in the electronic version. If you click on those links, it will take you to those studies. Okay. These are pretty conclusive studies that, that pretty conclusively prove if you're taking notes like this as opposed to like this, you don't retain nearly as much as you do if you're taking it by, by hand. Okay? Because when you're taking notes this way, you are merely transcribing. That is, you become like a dictaphone or a recorder, and you're not filtering. When you filter, your brain's telling you, you know, this definite article does, not really all that important, so I can leave it out. But otherwise, you're trying to get everything, right? So, um, that's what that's about. Do notice, however, you are allowed to use your laptop, tablet, phone for reading electronic versions of the course. And believe me, I'll be able to tell if you're reading an electronic version of the text or texting. Because if you're reading it, down here, you're not reading it because your, your phone isn't Braille. Okay, um, and if you're doing something else down here, please leave. Go find a dark alley or whatever. Uh, just don't. If that continues, okay, first time I see you using your phone for, you know, not class purposes, I'll say something. I won't say anything after that. I'll just report you to the dean of students, and they'll probably remove you from the class. Okay, um, classroom decorum. What's decorum mean? Proper behavior. So, attendance, participation, and decorum. What do those mean? They mean, I think I scared the hell out of my first class. I mean, eyes were big as saucers. Arrive to class on time. I mean, class doesn't begin, what, till 1020. Plenty of time. Um, arriving after class has begun is rude, disrespectful, disruptive. Two, you're quiet, you pay attention to me and to others when others are speaking. If others are asking questions, others are answering questions, are they making points, you know, don't shout over them, don't be talking with somebody else. Three, you're courteous to others. That kind of reinforces the first two. It also means don't call somebody an idiot because they disagree with what you think. Um, four, when you speak in class, use language appropriate to the setting. No swearing or foul language. Every now and then I'll use a damn or hell. But no F-bombs right, or other, um, we're not in a bar. <laughs> uh, number five, don't eat, please, during class. I'll see people doing this because somebody's munching on a bag of crunchy Doritos or something right next to them or uh, blowing bubbles with their gum. Um, six, don't sleep during class. Told my... My first class a long time ago, I don't know, 15, 20 years ago, I had a student, individual desk in, an, in another classroom. He would come in, it was an 8 o'clock class, he would come in every morning and put his head down on the desk and go to sleep. And almost every morning I would come up and <coughs> do that. But I would do that a lot harder than I just did. So his head would pop up and then, you know, sometimes smack back down. Okay? I will embarrass you. I also did one, one time in one class, it was a late afternoon class, the classroom was hot, and this guy just fell asleep and was just snoring, and I just went, and we all left, just, just let him sleep, I, he didn't sleep anymore after that, if I remember correctly, I think he was pretty ashamed, um, so don't fall asleep, um, seven, don't do homework or assignments for other classes during this class, Do that when you do homework and assignments for other classes, okay? Uh, don't wear headphones or earbuds during this class. I mean, if you have them around your neck and they're dangling, that's fine. I had a student last semester who came in with his beats every day and had them on all throughout class. In fact, one day I kind of walked, oh, and I could hear it. So it wasn't it. He just had them on and no sound. It was, he you know, was just drowning me out. And that's fine. If you want to drown me out, just leave. Serious. No skin off my back. Just leave. It's your money. It's not mine. Right? Um, or your parents or whoever's. 
Uh, last one. Don't cheat or plagiarize. I mean, she goes without saying. So, what happens if you do all of these or don't do all of these, depending on whichever the case may be? Uh, one, I'll speak to you. And if you keep doing it, I'll report you to student affairs after you be removed from the class. And about 95% of the time, they do. They, they pretty much go along with what um, the professor says. And sometimes, if you're removed from class and you show up again, um, it won't be me removing you from class. It'll be MTSU's best in blue. I mean, we've had cops come to class to physically remove people before. Okay. Um, what else? We cover a lot of materials every class period. I mean, Lord of the Rings is 1,200 pages. I mean, good God, Order of the Phoenix is, it seems like 1,200 pages. Uh, it's 880 some pages on its own. So we cover a lot of material. What that means is you really don't want to miss. But life being what it is, you're allowed three absences. That is. Three absences, no harm, no foul. Nothing happens grade-wise. Fourth absence, however, one letter grade reduction. You got an A, you have a B. You have a C, you have a D. You have a D, not so good. Uh, fifth absence, failure in the course. Now what that also means is, let's say you're planning on, let's see, this class meets Monday, Wednesday, Friday, meets 10 o'clock relatively, Mardi Gras is on a Tuesday, and you're going to go out and get totally wasted Tuesday night. So you're just going to, you know, sleep in on Wednesday. Well, that's one of your free absences. But then later in the semester, you get pneumonia, and you miss three days. Well, now you were into a fourth absence. So you were cruising along, doing really well, and you had an A. Now you have a B. And then, oh, you get a ticket. And the cop stops you, and you miss class. Now you have five. Now you failed the course. Okay? So, you can choose how you want to use them, or just not use them, and, you know, whatever. Um, what else? Apps, um, roll, if you're not present when roll is taken or when a quiz has begun, you'll be counted absent, and or receive a zero for the quiz. I'm not usually as hard as that sounds, especially the first few weeks. Um, if I've given out the quiz and you walk in, you know, a minute, two minutes, three, whatever, three minutes later, I'm going to give you the quiz. Probably if you walk in and there's a minute left, you'll have five to ten minutes, ten minutes most for quizzes. I might hand it to you and say, you got a minute. So you better start scribbling fast, because I'm not going to give you the same amount of time everybody else had. Um, and there are no makeup quizzes. All right? I will drop the lowest quiz grade. All right? So if you're not there for the quiz, you get a zero, and that's the only one you miss, then that doesn't count against you, essentially. All right? Papers are due. Beginning of class. Now let me back up. Let me know if... if in advance, you know you're going to miss class. No makeup quizzes or exams will be given. Late papers accepted only with prior approval. Okay, Papers are the exams. That's, you're not doing any research papers or anything like that. Papers are due at the beginning of class on the assigned days. Okay, Beginning of class. Class begins at 1020. So when you come in at 1020 or before, you'll hand me your paper. Not at 1045 or 1105. Okay? Um, unapproved late papers will receive an F. If you didn't turn in your paper, you fail the course. So if you didn't get an extension on a paper, turn it in. Even if it's a week late, turn it in. Why? You'll get an F. An F is 55 points. A zero, not turning in the paper, means F for the course. I had three students in my Shakespeare course last fall who, for some reason, 
did not turn in their term papers. Term papers were like a week, week and a half before final exams. So I hadn't gotten to all those papers before I was grading final exams. And I started, you know, organizing stuff. And I went through the papers and I saw these three and thought, huh. And I went and looked. Yeah, they took the final exam, but they didn't turn in their term papers. Made it easy for me because I didn't need to grade their final exams at that point. Because they'd already failed the course by not turning in those required papers. Okay? I didn't mention this um, to my first class. But if you do miss class, every class is recorded and put up on YouTube. And it's put on this channel. So when, if you open the electronic document, click on that link. Um, it's right there. There's the failure to complete any other than quizzes. Failure to complete any assignment will result in failure. Grading's real easy. Total number of points you earn divided by the total number of points possible gives me a number. The number falls within this and what's on the next page range. You get an 89.5. You get an A. Like it's rounded up. 89.4. You're so close. But it's still a B. <laughs> uh, or B plus. Sorry. Okay. And there can be a little fudging on that. A little fudging up and a little fudging down. A little fudging up, you've been here every day, you've been responsive, not catatonic. You know, that helps to move things up a little bit. So, the schedule. I had asked you if you saw um, the syllabus and read it, printed it out and stuff, I asked you to. Read Tolkien's essay on fairy stories. I know it's long. It's like 65 pages. Um, and to watch my lecture on it, we'll talk a little bit about it today. Not much because we're going to run out of time. Um, so that we could then start on Wednesday, Fellowship of the Ring. And I don't know what happened. I had similar problems with my syllabus in my first class. And I went over these things, and I was positive I emailed the right ones. But I must not have. Because notice, Monday's a screw-up. Monday the 21st, we do not have class. Please do not show up. Why? The building will be locked. <laughs> the university's closed on Monday for ML King um, holiday. Which means there's three days for uh, Fellowship of the Ring. Unless we jump into some of it today, which again, we won't have time. Um... But we'll, we'll do what we can. And then four days for two towers. Maybe a little bit more. Four and a half, maybe more days for Return of the King. And bear in mind, Return of the King in here is really only... is really only this much. It's only about 170, 180 pages. Why? Because this is all Tolkien's nerd stuff. This is all appendix, you know, genealogies, how you pronounce the names correctly, how you write in Elvish and Tingwar if you want to, etc. And I had nerd friends in high school. They spoke Elvish and I was like, get a life, man. I have known people who, because I used to be in this, in this weird group. And so, but we won't go into that. Um, so I'll give out the exam, assuming we don't have to modify the, the schedule, on February 11th. Uh, that exam will probably have somewhere between four to seven topics. Choose one. Okay? And it'll be very clear what you have to do. And there's a little bit more about it at the bottom of the syllabus. And then a week later is when that's due. In class, hard bound, uh, hard copy, probably with the exam sheet stapled to it. Okay? Uh, and then we'll start Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone slash Sorcerer's Stone. Now, I've got it in three days for that, but we'll probably do it in two because it's real fluffy. I mean, it's like marshmallow compared to the Lord of the Rings, and the Lord of the Rings is like old, hard beef jerky. You really got to chew it to get into it. Right? Oh, and now I'll wait until the end of this. 
So, three days for Philosopher's Stone, three days Chamber of Secrets, three days Prisoner of Azkaban, we'll probably get off there. That is, we'll get behind. Um, spring Break, Goblet of Fire. Goblet of Fire is a lot longer than Prisoner of Azkaban and Chamber of Secrets and Philosopher's Stone. We'll probably get a little bit behind there. And then Order of Phoenix, it's like she took a bunch of writing steroids and just um, brain dumped everything she was thinking into that novel. So notice there are five days. And then five days for Half-Blood Prince. It's shorter than Order of the Phoenix, but it is more densely packed. It, there's a much, much more key essential information. Order of the Phoenix could be, if a really good editor took a scalpel to Order of the Phoenix, you could cut that thing down by a third. So why is it so long? Detail? Well, description. Kind of. Yeah, a little bit. Why else? I mean, you're you're more high-minded. Go, go lower-minded. It's for kids. Every word in her novels from about this one on is what? Cha-ching, cha-ching, cha-ching. I mean, she and Bloomsbury Scholastic are just raking in the bucks. Okay? I mean, uh, Order of the Phoenix, when it was published, if I remember right, it had, it was something like 11 million advanced sales. 11 million copies sold before anybody could hold a copy of the book. At, what, 20 95 a copy? I mean, she was the, the literal golden goose. And every word she laid, dollars, pound signs, whatever you Okay. And then Half-Blood Prince, Deathly Hallows, and we won't have enough time to do everything we need to in Deathly Hallows because I always run out of time. Last time I taught this course, I tried to reverse it. I tried to do the Harry Potter stuff first and then the Lord of the Rings, and then we didn't have enough time for the Lord of the Rings. Um, so, essay exam, you got important dates there for those of you who want to drop the course. I doubt anybody will well, because it will be so exciting and simple. Not really. Uh, exams. Two 900 to 1200 word exams. That's all the writing you do for this course. Okay. One exam over Lord of the Rings, one exam over the seven Harry Potter novels. Okay. But they're pretty specific. So notice this. It's in bold and you'll have the exact same instructions on the handout. Okay. For the Tolkien take home exam. You must have five substantive and appropriate direct quotations, not paraphrases, summary, direct quotations, from the Lord of the Rings. At least one quotation must come from each of the three volumes. You have to have a quotation from Fellowship of the Ring, a quotation from the Two Towers, and a quotation from The Return of the King. I don't care where you take the other two from. But if you have two quotations from Return of the King, Excuse me. And three quotations from the two towers, and you have no quotations from the Fellowship of the Ring, you received an F. That'll be your automatic grade. I won't read the paper. Okay. Harry Potter. You have to have too close. A substantive and direct quotation from five different Harry Potter novels. So, works cited page, you're going to have five Harry Potter novels there. If you have four, you've got an F. Because there's supposed to be five. If you had six, that's fine. If you have all seven, that's fine too. But you have to have at least five, and there has to be a quotation from each of those five. Okay? I tell all my classes, 90% of success in life is following directions. It's real, real easy. You don't follow directions, you never get a driver's license. Why? Because you can't figure out the laws of the state. 
And if you can't follow these kinds of directions, I'll be really, really blunt. You shouldn't be here. Right? You, you, you shouldn't be here if you can't follow these kinds of simple directions. Um, and then I go into you know other stuff there, talk about quotations, and then the rest of the syllabus, you know, I have some stuff at the top about what kinds of papers receive what kinds of grades. This part is just about F papers. And then this kind of stuff about citing and documenting sources, which would be good for you for citing, you know, Tolkien and Rowling. Your exams, you don't have to do any research. That is, any external research. No library stuff, no critics, etc. It'll be your responses to the partic uh, particular topics that you are given on the topic sheet. Shut off. Okay. Any questions so far? Yes. Uh, regarding the MLA format, most of, actually all of my writing has been in APA. How very different is that going to be trying to switch up the writing styles? It'll be a little different, but it's about what the last 10 pages of this are. Because I give you how to cite MLA style with parenthetical and what the works cited page should look like and that kind of thing. Okay, is that uh, going to be a severe hit if it's not, say, in perfect... Uh, not if it's not perfect because you're not English majors. Okay. okay? Um, and what I would say, what I always tell students is, if you have any question, email me or ask me. Okay? Um, I won't look at advanced copies of these because they're exams. They're not, you know, traditional term papers kind of thing. But if you have a question, you know, one, if you're ever in question whether you should cite something, cite it. Always err on the side of caution. Okay? Um, that doesn't mean what I had a upper division English major do last fall, where I'm not kidding. If there were a stack of Bibles here, I would swear on them. Every single sentence in a seven page paper had a citation. And I said, about halfway through, because I drew a line and said, I'm done. <laughs> I said, so what you're telling me is there is zero thought of your own in here. You've taken everything from somebody else. That's not a research paper. That's not an argumentative paper. That's, it's kind of like Xeroxing. But you're just Xeroxing one sentence after another and, you know, pacing them all together. Um, that's not good, so don't do that. Okay. Um, Tolkien's on fairy story. Let, let me let me back up. How many of you have read Lord of the Rings? Okay, a handful of you. How many of you have seen Lord of the Rings? Okay. For those of you who have seen Lord of the Rings, I'm going to advise you to do like what Hamlet says he is going to do with all former saws and things that he has learned. Wipe them clean from your mind. Why? Because the Lord of the Rings films are not the Lord of the Rings books. They're very, very different. Okay? I'm not talking about cinema. Cinematography is perfect. I mean, Jackson's a fantastic visual, you know, artist, etc. The problem with Peter Jackson is he thinks he's a better writer than Tolkien. And he's not fit to write on Tolkien's toilet paper, if, you know, words were to come to it. Okay. Harry Potter. How many of you have read the Harry Potter novels? Yeah, that's what I thought. More of you. Still not that many. How many of you have seen any of the Harry Potter films? Okay, those are even worse than the Lord of the Rings films. Okay. Um, the, first, the first one's actually, the first one and the third one I think are actually the best. But those ought to really be called the greatest hits of Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone and Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban. Okay. Because you get Great scenes, but there's nothing to connect the scenes. You don't get a narrative plot in the films. Here's the real problem with the Harry Potter films. One through eight, because the last book's two films, right? Completely changes the meaning of the books. And that's because of two things that are done. One at the beginning of the seventh film, and one at the end of the eighth film. 
They take two things out. One thing from the beginning of the seventh book, one thing from the end of the seventh book. And by taking those two things out, it totally changes okay, what the stories do. Okay? But we'll talk about that when we get to it. So, Lord of the Rings. If you've never Lord, if you've never Lord the Red of the Rings, if you've never read the Lord of the Rings, um, or anything like the Lord of the Rings, this might be difficult for you. Okay, for this reason, Tolkien is a very dense author. What do I mean by that? How many? Again, who's read Lord of the Rings? Show of hands. Describe Lord of the Rings. There's a lot of description well, and so much detail. That's it. Detail and description. Okay. Um, Everything has a scene. Pretty much. And if it's even slightly important, it has a song or story that goes with it. Okay. Why? Because all the literature that Tolkien loved was the same way. Tolkien was a medievalist. Or... Anglo-Saxonist, but he didn't only know and learn and teach Anglo-Saxon. He taught um, Middle English literature. He taught some Gothic stuff. He knew, knew, could read. What's the number? It's either 14 or 17 languages. Okay. He could speak, I think, about half of those. And he started learning these when he was a a little kid. I mean, he started learning Greek and Latin when he was like six and seven, and French and such. Okay? So he was a master when it came to languages. And the whole Lord of the Rings, we'll talk about this when we start the, the introduction and such. The whole Lord of the Rings is born out of his love of language. He writes all these stories because he started with inventing languages. And he realized languages don't exist without what? Meaning. Keep going. People. People. You don't have a language without a speaker of the language. So he realized, well, I've been creating these languages. I've got to have people who speak them. Well, what do people not exist without? Meaning, how do people give their lives quote-unquote meaning? Stories. Stories. Myths. Histories, etc. All right? So let's back up a little bit. I'd ask you to read Tolkien's on fairy stories. Why? Is the Lord of the Rings a fairy story? What is a fairy story? Is it a story about fairies? A make-believe tale. A make-believe tale? Okay. So what's the difference between Lord of the Rings, a make-believe tale, and any film currently showing at any theater? Because any film currently showing at any theater is also a make-believe tale. Does a fairy story have to have fairies? Okay. Tolkien talks about, when he's talking about the section on fantasy, it involves a secondary world. That is, a world created by the author that when you read... You enter into that world. Or another way he describes it is the author creates in your mind a secondary world. And I usually use the analogy because we live in a different technological age than, she, than uh, Tolkien did. The author reformats your brain and does what? Creates a section, formats a different partition called, if you're reading Lord of the Rings, Middleware. And while you are reading, you are in that partition of your brain. You're in the D drive and not the C drive, so to speak. Okay? Have any, have any of you ever had this experience reading? Where you're reading something and you are totally there? Or a film. You're watching it and you're totally there and you become oblivious to what's going on around. See, film doesn't, can't do that for me. I'm one of those weird people, I, I suffer, and I don't remember, misophonia or something like that. Little noises drive me crazy. All my dogs have long nails, and we have hardwood all throughout the house, and they all follow me. 
so it's constantly, and he drives me crazy, okay? People eating popcorn and all that kind of stuff. I can usually, you know, try to focus, but books, especially if you're by yourself, maybe you got some music or something playing, headphones, whatever. People describe the experience of entering into the experience of the book. And while in the book, being there. Like sailing with, uh, I don't know, Eustace and Lucy on the voyage of the Dawn Treader in the Chronicles of Narnia. My first experience, first experience finishing The Lord of the Rings. Because I tried it two times before. I got, I don't know, 50 pages and I was like, oh man, this is really boring. I was in my teens really boring. But once it stuck, first time reading and getting to the passage where Aragorn, Legolas, and Gimli are chasing after the orcs trying to find Merry and Pippin, I was like right there running alongside with them. You know, somebody call my name? I wouldn't hear it. I mean, you'd have to come up and whack me on the head to get my attention. Right? Why? I was in the D drive. I wasn't in the C drive anymore. The C drive is this world, I was in that secondary world, okay? Tolkien, when he delivered this lecture on fairy stories, he said, you know, you guys asked me to, de to deliver this, so I, I ought to say something about fairy stories. So he began the way every undergraduate, almost every undergraduate, begins a paper. Dictionary definition. What's a fairy story? Well, let's look at the OED. Tolkien worked on the OED. Oxford English Dictionary. And he quotes a bunch of definitions. He says, well, that's not going to help us at all. Why? Because there are fairy stories. OED says the story of or pertaining to fairies. But there are fairy stories that don't have fairies in them. Here's an example. Luke Skywalker. And Darth Vader. And their relationship is a fairy story. Any fairies? The elves. Siri, really? An elf is a type oh, of shit. Sure. <laughs> you do that all the time. <laughs> so, Tolkien says he can't define a fairy story, but he knows what it is when he sees it. It's kind of like, I think it was um, William Douglas an American Supreme Court justice had a case of um, whether or not something was pornography before the Supreme Court. And he said, famously, I can't say what it is. That is, I can't define pornography, but I know it when I see it. Okay? Because what does it mean to define something? Give an absolute definition. Okay. Gives an absolute definition, comes from the word define. That's what's called a tautology, by the way. It's kind of circular reasoning. So what do you do when you define something? Describe its properties. Okay, you describe its properties. Okay, the word describe and define, they both have that prefix D, right? It means out or away or of or from. Scribe means to write. Okay. Fine means to put a limit, like Finite versus infinite. In, the beginning of that word means not. Not finite. So it's limitless. So when you define something, what are you doing? You're putting a border around it. You're saying it's everything in here but not what is outside. Tolkien says, I can't even do that. Because I can't say only this, 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 and this are fairy stories. Why? Somebody might come up with a fairy story that doesn't include those things. All right? So, in this essay, he argues that fairy stories are meant for whom, ultimately? Did, did anybody read it? No. I wasn't actually expecting anybody to, so it's us. Adults. Fairy stories are for little kids, right? Give me an example of a fairy story. Uh, 
Hansel and Gretel. Hansel and Gretel. That's weird because that's exactly what I was saying. <laughs> <laughs> the one I used in my first class was Little Red Riding Hood. Why are those for children? They have a moral. They have a moral. Okay. They're extremely simple. Yeah. They're extremely simple. Now, I have a colleague who would say, oh, you want to bet? Because, <laughs> I mean, she reads Little Red, or I had a colleague used to, she reads Little Red Riding Hood, I'm sitting there going, what? <laughs> really? There's that much sex in Little Red Riding Hood? I don't think so. You know, not everything that's red represents menstrual blood, you know, or whatever. Uh, as Freud famously said, sometimes a cigar is just a cigar. Right? Not everything is foul. Though for Freud, most everything was. <laughs> so, Hansel and Gretel teach the moral. What moral does Hansel and Gretel teach children? It's been a while since I read it, but I'm going to go with... Uh, What's the basic story? Listen to your parents. They got lost. Two little kids. They get lost in the forest. Hansel, you know, leaves the breadcrumbs. The birds come eat the breadcrumbs, so... If you get lost, bring more than breadcrumbs. What else? Don't trust strangers. Don't trust strangers. Why? Because it might be the nasty, wicked witch who lives in the gingerbread house. And what does she want to do with fat little children? Throw them in her oven and eat them. Now, if you've read the real Hansel and Gretel, what do the fat little children do? Don't they throw her? They throw the her in the oven and cook her. They don't eat her. Pretty grim stuff. We get that adjective grim from the Grimm's brothers, Jacob and Wilhelm, who collected these stories, the Grimm's fairy tales, etc. So, tell me, why does a 10-year-old really need that story? Or why, what other purpose does that story teach other than listen to your parents, don't go wandering off in the dark woods, can lead to, you know, danger, etc. Puts the lessons in a fun way. Okay. I, I don't know how fun I would say that is, but well, I, I, mean, I, I get your point. Type. Entertaining, imaginary. Okay. What else does it teach? If something's too good to be true, it probably is. Could be. Also, uh, defend yourself if someone tries to hurt you. Possibly. Though Hansel and Gretel don't really do much defending, except for throwing her in the oven. How about there are real monsters? They're just not, you know, alien monster. Monsters can take what form? I'm not casting aspersions on anybody. This form. Monsters can be your next door neighbor. Literally had that happen. Wasn't my next door neighbor. He was four houses down. Grew up in San Jose, California. Santa Cruz Mountains, just outside San Jose. One Zodiac murderer. I used to go to bed at night literally afraid this guy was going to break into my room. Because I lived 15 minutes from the Santa Cruz Mountains. But I didn't need to worry about the Zodiac Killer. Because I found out after I had moved away from home, a couple of years after I would moved away from home, a guy who lived four houses down was named Leonard Lake. Look him up. He was one of the most prolific mass murderers in U.S. history. He invited... One of my sisters, I'm the youngest of five, he invited one of my sisters and I into his house one Halloween when we were doing trick-or-treating. We're like, oh, no thank you. And then they followed us for a little bit. And again, about 10 years later, we find out this guy had been arrested with an accomplice and he had a big plot of land in the San Joaquin Valley and they discovered, I don't remember what it was, something like 20 or 30 bodies. Monsters in our midst. They're not all shaped like grindles or like I said, the alien monster and stuff. Okay? Tolkien argues we are the ones in need of fairy stories. Why? Life full of responsibility. Okay. It's an escape. It's an escape. Do little kids need to know, need to be taught that there are real monsters? Think about that a little bit more. Think of their imaginative lives. You can see it from both sides. 
they need to know that there are things like that, but at the same time, you don't want to ruin their childhood. You just want to be in there and think that the world is pure like they thought originally. But do little kids even think the world is pure? Don't they imagine it to them to come up with some monsters in the closet? Pretty yeah. scary ideas. Yeah, I mean, why is why is Monsters Inc. work so well? And if you've not seen it, you really ought to see it. Is Monsters Inc. a kids movie? No. Is any Pixar film a kid? No. They're for us. Why? So we can relive our childhood. Maybe for some people. Or is it more of so that we can better understand how we are now as opposed to how we were like then? Okay? We need these things, Tolkien says, because they offer us these four things. Fantasy, recovery, escape, consolation. I'm going back to that. Fantasy is pretty easy. It's that other world kind of thing. It's like, oh, we're not in Kansas anymore, Toto. When Star Wars, the first one, first came out, to be there in a packed screen and see those words move from the bottom of the screen and drift off into infinity, and then to see that Star Destroyer come in from the top of the screen and have that Star Destroyer look different than any other spaceship in a quote-unquote science fiction film. I mean, Stanley Kubrick had come out with 2001 A Space Odyssey, about 10 years, yeah, about 10 years earlier, 1968, I think it was. All the, all the ships in 2001 looked like they had just come off the assembly line. Brand spanking new, shiny, perfectly white, and that Star Destroyer comes in, and what do you notice? It's got blast marks. This sucker had been around the proverbial block a few times. Okay? That was radically different. That was... Tolkien describes as arresting strangeness. Okay, we'll stop there. I'm going to go over these real quickly on um, Wednesday. We'll talk about that quote a little bit too. And then jump into the introduction, whether we actually start Fellowship of the Ring or not. We'll see. Hey, uh, real quick, I'll shoot you an email just as a written reminder. But